Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Health, Environment, Civil Rights, and Engagement Committee. My name is Philippe Cunningham, Council Member for the Fourth Ward and proud chair of this committee. With me at the dais are Council Members Cano, Schrader, Council uh, Vice President Jenkins, and Vice Chair Gordon. Uh, that makes a quorum of this committee, and we can conduct business. I also want to welcome uh, Council Member Palmasano. Thank you for being here. So, uh, colleagues, on today's agenda, we have four items. Two public, the first two are public hearings, and items number three and four are consent. What we'll go ahead and do is we will uh, complete the consent agenda so that we can um, get into the public hearing. So, did you want to speak to something? No. Oh, you were just excited. Okay. So, um, so we'll go ahead and get started with our consent agenda. Um, uh, so item number three is approving the council appointment of me to the seat nine ward four two year term for the uh, violence prevention steering committee appointment. I will be abstaining from that vote for obvious reasons. Um, and item number four is setting a public hearing for August 12th to consider passage of an ordinance amending Title 13, Chapter 267 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to licenses and business regulations, amusements, adding and amending provisions related to places of adult entertainment. I will turn to my colleague, uh, Council Member Gordon, to move item number item number three. I'm happy to move item number three. I can move the entire consent Actually, agenda go ahead, if you yeah, want. Go ahead, yeah, yeah. Move the consent agenda. All right. Uh, Council Member Gordon has made a motion to uh, approve the two items. Again, please let the record reflect that I am abstaining from uh, item number three. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say, aye, or say nay. The ayes have it and that those items carry. Next up, we have our two public hearings. The first is um, on the passage of an ordinance amending Title 13, Chapter 301 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances related to licenses and business regulations, laundries and dry cleaning establishments amending regulations to prohibit the use of PERC in dry cleaning facilities. So, let me see here. Do we have anybody who's signed up to speak to that? Okay, but we have our, pre do we have a presentation? Uh, great, all right, so we have our Director of Environmental Services in the Health Department, Patrick Hamlin, the floor is yours. All right, uh, yeah, my name's Patrick Hamlin, uh, Chair Cunningham, Council Members. Uh, Council Member Johnson is authoring this ban on uh, PERC to solidify our existing ordinance um, of um, removing PERC from any, uh, making sure that no PERC machine in Minneapolis, or sorry, no dry cleaning machine in Minneapolis uses PERC. Um, so I'm speaking today as a staff member from the health department on the issue. Uh, in recent air quality studies, uh, we found PERC, a hazardous potential cancer causing chemical, uh, found throughout Minneapolis um, in a study that we did over Minnesota Department of Health chronic health risk values at 99 locations around Minneapolis. That was a study that was done in 2015 when I say uh, recent. Um, while dry cleaners are not the only source, they are a major known source of PERC in Minneapolis. Through our collaborative work with the cleaners and switching out PERC machines, we have found levels of PERC, perk much higher than anyone expected when we were doing that work. In many cleaners, these levels were over Minnesota Department of Health acute health risk values. That means that over these were values that were over values that were considered safe immediately. So workers were getting acute levels of exposure to this chemical. And right now there are hundreds of, potentially hundreds of workers in dry cleaners all over Minnesota who are breathing in these levels of PERC right now, but not here in Minneapolis. We have created the blueprint for a PERC-free Minnesota and what that looks like by working together, right now we're working together with innovative counties like Ramsey County, Washington County, in developing programs of their own. We've presented the risks to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and we can only hope that they are following suit in working with our blueprint to, sol to be effective in solving this problem statewide. <clears throat> this move that we're doing today would be controversial in any other city in the United States. 
It's not, it's not controversial here because we've worked together with the dry cleaning industry to focus on solving the problem instead of fighting each other. We may not even agree on the scope of the problem, but we have found a way to come together to solve it by switching all of our dry cleaners away from PERC to become the first PERC-free dry clean, cleaning city in the United States, and we did it together. I also want to give thanks to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the Minnesota Department of Health, the University of Minnesota Technical Assistance Program, Environmental Initiative, Tangletown Neighborhood, Wyndham Neighborhood, East Isles Neighborhood Association, Lowry Hill East Neighborhood Association, and the Minnesota Cleaners Association, who is here today. As I said, this would normally be controversial, and you'd be hearing from different sides on the issue today, and uh, thankfully you're going to be dealing with, uh, you're going to be having hearings on other matters, uh, because we're, this issue is going to be um, tight to, to, to pass and, and uh, to work towards. I wanted to find, I wanted to take a different approach. Um, and while anyone can, of course, comment, the only people uh, that we individually notified of today's hearings were the individual dry cleaners and the dry cleaning association. The people who would ordinarily be fighting us, <clears throat> these are the people that would ordinarily be fighting us. I don't expect them to speak in favor of a perk ban today. Uh, but hopefully they can come up and comment on the effecti effectiveness of our TAT here in Minneapolis. Working with the Cl Dry Cleaners Association was just the proving ground of how we can work together with stakeholders in the community. We have extended this concept to auto the auto body industry where we have switched over the last paint tech training facility at Newgate School earlier this year. We're working with nail salons. Our first project is, is in Philippe Cunningham's ward at Mimi Nails to reduce worker exposures to these chemicals. We're working with manufacturing, with building owners, nonprofits, rental license holder, holders, and we are using the same approach that we use with dry cleaners to address what is a seemingly insurmountable challenge in climate change. <clears throat> this is a recipe. This is a recipe of partnerships that leverage our ability, effective use of regulation, and reinvestment of fees directly into solutions. Um, and so I just want to uh, present that as a, a staff perspective, and I'm sorry that was a little bit choppy. Um, uh, but I, I'm very proud of this work and, and the model that it set for uh, addressing pollution here in Minneapolis and that we can work with our stakeholders, work with business owners to overcome real challenges that they have. And so if you don't mind, I'd like to invite up the uh, president of the Dry Cleaning Association, uh, Keith. Uh, Keith with the Dry Cleaning Association, and he'll come up and uh, present his perspective, and it should be within the three-minute time frame here. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much. The floor is yours, if you can introduce yourself for the record. My name is Keith Owney. I'm the owner of East Metro Clean and Press in West St. Paul, Minnesota, and I also volunteer my time as the president of the Minnesota Cleaners Association. I want to thank everyone here, and I'll just be real brief on this. Uh, Patrick Hanlon reached out to me to, to see if I could talk about the recent public-private success that Minneapolis has had with some of the dry cleaners in the city. Over time, our understanding about the health risks of using the chemical perchloroethylene, also called perk, in the dry cleaning process has changed. Many dry cleaners in the state have already been able to switch to the more environmentally friendly cleaning methods of the 100 or so total dry cleaning facilities in the entire state of Minnesota. We estimate only one-third have yet to switch. Ordinances that mandate businesses must change their processes can be controversial in many cities. Legal positioning, along with wasted time, energy, and money can often be greater than the cost of the actual change itself. In our industry, the cost of switching to the new dry cleaning machines can be large for these small businesses, and some just cannot afford it. Some businesses may have a tough choice of closing their doors if a forced change would have been in place, costing jobs and valuable services in their cities. This is where the public, private, collaborative approach with the City of Minneapolis has been a success. This program uses funds from multiple sources to help assist these small businesses in making a change to new dry cleaning machines that do not use PERC. In doing so, Minneapolis has become the first major city to eliminate PERC from their dry cleaners. Not only did this public-private partnership meet its goals, it did so in a way that removed barriers between those involved. This helps create trust going forward between businesses and the cities they operate in. In my opinion, this is just as important as the end result was. On behalf of the Minnesota Dry Cleaners Association, we want to say that the effort of those involved is very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming to share your experience. Thank you. Patrick, is there anyone else that you wanted to? Okay. 
Great, so um, now I will go ahead and officially open the public hearing. Um, is there anyone here who would like to speak to this item? Anyone? Anyone? All right, seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Um, I just wanna briefly uh, speak to this item and see if my colleagues have any uh, comments on it. Um, I was basically raised in dry cleaners. Uh, my mom worked in a dry cleaner for most of my childhood. And so um, fortunately, I didn't get sick from that experience, but um, I think that it's really powerful to see the city really step up in such a way um, in which the city instead of being the hammer, it extends a hand to say, this is how we can work together in order to have healthier outcomes. I think that's really powerful because the city, people say the city, right? And it's this scary entity. And this is an opportunity to really begin to shift that narrative. So I wanna thank you, Patrick, so much for your leadership on this. You really have set a model and really not only for the industry, but for the city as a whole. So thank you so much for your leadership. Do any of my questions, my colleagues have any questions or comments? Councilmember Schrader. I just want to take this opportunity to echo uh, those sentiments and uh, thank Director Hanlon for just being so thoughtful about doing this outreach. Um, and even without this ordinance, we would be a city that's uh, perk free. Um, and especially want to thank you for the work you did in my ward um, to work with the businesses and the neighborhood association to really make something that's going to work while taking care of the small business. I just want to briefly um, point out that room 319 is it, it's open um, for overflow and uh, the TV is on. So there, is, so folks, if you want to get some somewhere to sit, we have a 319. Councilmember Gordon, I just wanted to um, also extend my gratitude not only to our staff but also to the businesses that got involved and um, uh, worked together to do this, and also note that. This is a formula that we can easily apply to other businesses. So as people think about polluting businesses in the city, practices that are going on that we're concerned about by working together and coming with some resources that the city has and expertise, I think we can tackle um, other issues in other areas. And I'm looking forward to how we can do that and transition some other industries into cleaner practices. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, seeing none. I move approval of the ordinance, passage of the ordinance amending Title 13, Chapter 301. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Thank you so much again. Um, I just want to also point out that it's a big deal that we're the first city to not to have banned perk. So I don't want that to fly under the radar because it's like not super sexy because it's chemicals and you know we can kind of forget about it. But it is actually a very big deal, um, not only for the workers themselves but for our environment overall. So just want to point that out. Next, what I think everybody might be here for is item number two, uh, passage of the ordinance amending title two of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to administration, preventing wage theft, adding overtime and break requirements, and restricting city contracts from being awarded to entities with outstanding wage obligations. All right, and we have a presentation. All right, the floor is yours. Committee Chair Cunningham, members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Brian Walsh. I am the manager of the Labor Standards Enforcement Division within the Department of Civil Rights. We have uh, been joined by a lot of people here today who I think are, are ready to speak, and many of them really truly are, the, are real experts on the issue of wage theft, so I, I will make my comments brief. And uh, Assistant City Attorney Andrea Neff has a few comments before we get to the public hearing. First, the historical context for the um, proposed wage theft preven prevention ordinance. On this, on this slide, you see how if economic growth had continued to spread across the U.S. like it did between 1959 and 1973, the poverty rate could now be essentially zero. Instead, from 1973 to 2017, net economic productivity represented by the dark blue line on this graph, expanded at more than six times the rate of wages represented on this graph by the light blue line. And poverty, with all its ripple effects, has expanded. From a business perspective, the cost of labor is unlike other business expenses because labor is actual people, which requires support and development. 
We know that proud Minneapolis employers, generally speaking, would like to be able to raise wages. We also know it's much more difficult for them to do so if they are not being allowed to compete on a level playing field. In other words, if some employers are shortchanging workers to undercut competitors' prices, our entire community suffers. In response, after decades of state and federal inaction, the, the city has already passed powerful new labor standards, a min, uh, Minneapolis Municipal Minimum Wage and Sick and Safe Time Ordinance. At the time of minimum wage ordinance passage in 2017, 54% and 41% of Latinx and black workers, respectively, across the city earned less than $15 an hour compared to only 17% of their white counterparts. Similarly, 41% of all Minneapolis workers lacked access to sick leave. What a wage theft ordinance could help accomplish is ensure that real people actually receive the benefits that our laws now promise them. Following passage of the Sick and Safe Time Ordinance in 2016, the city formally created a diverse group of stakeholders called the Minneapolis Workplace Advisory Committee. It includes employees and communities, small employers, large employers, and organized labor. You see the current members listed on this slide. Importantly, the city's current minimum wage ordinance does not protect workers earning more than minimum wage and contract law is often impossible or impractical for low-wage workers to enforce by themselves. We have heard from stakeholders, many of them listed on, uh, on this slide, many of them here in the room behind me. We've heard from them over and over over the last several years of outreach and engagement on this issue. We've heard uh, at forums, through surveys, in reports, and at listening sessions that communities deserve and government has an obligation to provide at least a very basic access to justice. Similarly, businesses rightly expect to compete on a level playing field. In the Civil Rights Department, we hear about wage theft every day. There, uh, unfortunately, is little we can currently do about it. The data on this slide helps put the size and scale of the problem of wage theft in perspective for you. It also illustrates how it affects everyone directly, especially in communities of color. A top priority, I'll note for the entire city enterprise, is rightly the growth and expansion of businesses owned by black, indigenous, and people of color. When customers of those very same businesses are earning more, they spend more, such that entire economies of color are built with real lasting investments from within. A wage theft ordinance is one tool that could help us create a more racially equitable economic foundation from which to grow. Uh, on this slide, we have some of the examples of what wage theft is. I think many of the comments today will help illustrate that further. I recognize that extensive education and technical assistance for employers is needed to reduce occurrences of wage theft. Importantly to that end, an outreach campaign is already in design stages with our communication staff, small business team, community planning and economic uh, development department. and many of the members of, of this, some of the members of this community, uh, committee I know are interested in that effort. In closing, before I turn to our assistant city attorney, I'll just note that civil rights and labor standards enforcement staff, the uh, folks that I manage in the civil rights department, we do, not view, uh, we do not view our investigations as moral crusades. They, these are not criminal investigations, they're civil. And for us, even a finding of a violation does not brand any employer as necessarily bad or evil. Instead, enforcement staff that I work with every day determines whether workers are owed money and what we can all do together to prevent repeat occurrences in the future. This type of collaborative spirit is more effective in building a culture of compliance where everyone, employers and employees can thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you want to come on up, um, Assistant City Attorney. I also just want folks to know if you are interested in speaking in the public hearing, uh, to please come over to the county, excuse me, the, the 
committee clerk mm -hmm. um, to be able to sign up. Andrea Neff, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham, committee members. My name is Andrea Neff, and I'm an assistant city attorney, and I'll be doing a brief overview of the ordinance, uh, the proposed ordinance that is before you for consideration today. First, the scope of the draft ordinance. Uh, the ordinance broadly covers all employers who have employees working in the city, with the exception of other government entities, federal, state, and other local government entities that are not under our jurisdiction. To be covered, employees must work for at least 80 hours per year within the city, and this includes full-time, part-time, and temporary employees, um, so long as they work that 80-hour threshold. There are some limited exclusions uh, for persons who participate in the state extended employment program, which is for uh, employees with uh, significant disabilities and for casual babysitters. The ordinance draft prohibits wage theft. It requires employers to pay their employees all wages that they have earned. Wages are very broadly defined to include all earnings, including commissions, uh, tips, and salaries. Of course, to be covered, the, the work must have been performed here in the city of Minneapolis within our jurisdiction. The ordinance also requires employers to establish a regular payday to inform their employees of when that payday is and then to actually adhere to the established payday. As you know, the state of Minnesota recently enacted a wage theft law at the state level. Um, one of the elements of that state law is a pre-hire notice requirement. And our city uh, draft ordinance incorporates elements of that state law, but then provides for some additional elements specific to Minneapolis. So I will refer to some of those additional things uh, in this presentation. The pre-hire notice requirement states that at the start of employment, employers must provide their employees with a notice, including the information that's required by the state wage theft law. And then additionally, our ordinance requires the date on which the employment is to begin, uh, a notice of the employee rights under the sick and safe time ordinance, a statement that tip sharing, if any, is involved in that position is voluntary, not mandatory, and if applicable to the position, uh, the overtime policy that will apply. Additionally, at the beginning of the employment, employers must give their employees a copy of the notice of rights that's provided by the city. That's something that is created by the Civil Rights Department that describes labor standards specifically applicable in Minneapolis. When employees are provided with the pre-hire notice, they must be given a copy of that information and the pre-hire notices must be signed by the employees to ensure that they've received it. Additionally, when employers wish to change the information in the notice, which obviously will happen from time to time, that information needs to be provided to the employees in writing before the change goes into effect and additionally, employees are required to sign to uh, show that they have received the notice of the changes. For current employees, uh, current employees must also receive pre-hire notices when this law goes to in, into effect unless they have already received all of the same information that would be contained in the pre-hire notice in which case they're not required to be provided with that information a second time, but anyone who has not received that information uh, must be provided with the notice. I would notice that these last two items, um, that the employee must sign the notice of changes and the current employee provision are additional elements um, over what the state law requires. Earning statements. Employers must provide employees with earning statements at the end of each pay period. The statements must include all of the information required by state law, and in Minneapolis, they must additionally include the sick and safe time hours that that employee has earned but has not yet used. Uh, 
There are notice and record keeping requirements in our draft ordinance. First, regarding the notice poster, the city will publish a notice of rights under the ordinance in all languages spoken by at least 5% of the workforce. That is something that is created by our civil rights department. And then employers are required to post those notices within their workplaces. The notice has to be posted in English and also in any language spoken by at least 5% of the workers. I would note that the notice poster requirement as to wage theft is different from state law, which currently the state currently does not have a wage theft notice poster. So this is an additional protection for employees um, being posted in Minneapolis workplaces. With regard to records, employers must maintain records demonstrating compliance, including the pre-hire notice, changes to it, and employee signatures on each of those. The earnings statements, together with all of the information required to demonstrate how an employee's pay was actually calculated. So for example, information on the commission structure that was used to generate that paycheck must be retained as well. A list of all personnel policies provided, and then those records must be maintained for at least three years to enable uh, the city to monitor and enforce the law when necessary. Overtime and break requirements are included in the draft ordinance in front of you. Although these requirements are not being incorporated into the article that will cover wage theft, they will be incorporated um, into the minimum wage ordinance, which is a more suitable place for those particular provisions. These will uh, incorporate state law requirements that employers must pay overtime rates required by state law and must provide rest and meal breaks. Again, these are requirements already in effect as a matter of state law, but incorporating them into our ordinance will enable the city's civil rights division to enforce these requirements. Retaliation against employees who assert their rights under the wage theft ordinance is prohibited. It is unlawful to interfere with restrain or deny the exercise of any right protected by this ordinance. An employee can establish retaliation uh, if the employee shows that the exercise of rights was a motivating factor in an adverse employment action taken against that employee, even if also uh, other factors were also present. And finally, there is a rebuttable presumption of retaliation if an employer within 90 days of an employee's exercise of rights materially changes the employee's terms or conditions of the employment. Of course, an employer can always rebut that by clear and convincing evidence of a different reason for the adverse action against the employee. This third bullet point, the rebuttable presumption, is an additional element that is not found in the current state law. Enforcement and remedies. This ordinance will be enforced by the Civil Rights Department. Uh, suspected violations must be reported to the department within two years of the violation or three years if the violation was willful in order to be investigated. The enforcement process that will be followed is very similar to the process our Civil Rights Department has already been following for the past couple years, enforcing our stick and safe time and minimum wage ordinances. And since that has been very successful, we have incorporated a process, the process very much by reference and it will be very similar. Generally speaking, employees can recover unpaid wages and liquidated damages to compensate them and violators are subject to being fined civil fines by the city. This is a list of remedies and for, uh, remedies that are available. Um, generally speaking, employees can recover compensatory damages and liquidate damages, and then the city can recover civil fines, uh, reimbursement of investigation costs, 
And there are fines um, listed here for record keeping violations, failure to provide notices, failure to post the notices, and each of the other requirements of the ordinance. I won't cover each of them in detail in deference to the folks that are waiting to speak, but the one thing I would note is that we do have a tiered penalty structure incorporated into this ordinance where repeat violators will pay more in liquidated damages and civil fines to the city for repeat violations. With that, I'll conclude my presentation, but I, I, Mr. Walsh and I are happy to stand for questions if you have any. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. First up, we have Council Vice President Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Cunningham and Ms. Neff um, for that presentation. I'm curious, um, who enforces the state law and will they whoever that entity is, will they sort of abide by this ordinance, this enhanced ordinance that we are proposing? Council Member Jenkins and committee members, the state law is relatively new, having just gone into effect on July 1st and some provisions not even in effect until August 1st. However, generally speaking, the State Department of Labor will be enforcing it along with the Attorney General's office is going to have a more active role under this new wage theft uh, ordinance at the state level. So the, the, those two entities will be involved. Those, neither one of those state level entities would be involved in enforcing our ordinance. That would be purely a city um, function. Thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much. I, I have a couple questions about who this applies to. Would it be safe to say that anybody who is already subject to the minimum wage and the safe and sick time ordinances would also be subject to the wage theft ordinances? Uh, Council Member Gordon, uh, committee members, the definition of employer is virtually identical to sick and safe. I want to compare my definitions before I answer precisely, but generally speaking, I do believe that's, that's the case. And you said um, mm -hmm. government employees, other uh, branches of government uh, don't fall under this ordinance, so the University of Minnesota wouldn't fall under it, the Minneapolis Public Schools wouldn't fall under it. That is correct. Park and Rec Board wouldn't fall under it. The That's county. correct. So some of the major, just so everybody's aware, some of the major employers um, mm -hmm. wouldn't fall under this ordinance in the city, but hopefully they'll um, have their own policies in place so that they aren't engaging in this kind of activity we're trying to prevent. And my other question has to do with independent contractors. So all those who are engaged in the shared economy, independent contractors, they're also outside the purview of this. Is that correct? That is correct. This, employee, this applies to employers and employees, and independent contractors are by definition not employees. So and, this does not apply to them. And we base that on a federal definition of employee, correct? There are definitions of employee and independent contractor that are, are outside the city's realm, yes. Right, we rely on that. All right, thank you very much. I will just add that we are working on that, um, independent uh, contractor uh, protections as well. So that was uh, moving just a little bit slower, it's a bigger body of work, it's still kind of new space, and so we didn't want to hold back all of the work. So I just want to let folks know we are working on that as well. Great, do any of my other colleagues have any questions? All right, great, thank you so much. I really appreciate the presentation and the information. We will now move, excuse me, I will now move into opening the public hearing. Again, if folks are interested in speaking, please be sure to sign up over uh, by the city or the uh, committee clerk. So first up, uh, so I'll go ahead and name folks and then the next two folks behind them so we can keep it moving and uh, get folks out of here in a reasonable time. So first up, we have Gilberto, followed by Kevin, and then Roger on deck. Hello, my name is Israel Aranda. I'm with the two and I will be interpreting. Hola, mi nombre es Gilberto. Uh, soy, formo parte del grupo de personas uh, víctimas de pago. So uh, my name is Gilberto, and I'm part of a group of people who have been victims of wage theft. 
within the construction industry here in, uh, in the Twin Cities. Trabajé un tiempo para una persona uh, por cinco meses. Me quedo debiendo doce mil dólares. So I worked for a person. Um, his name was Humana Construction. The person's name was Edgardo Humana. And uh, we were, I was working for him for about five months. I never got paid. And the total wages was over ten thousand dollars. Y pues le pediría de la manera más atenta al consejero municipal que siguieran apoyando a Cetul y a sus trabajadores para que no siguiera pasando este tipo de abusos a nosotros y otras personas que trabajamos. And so my ask today from the city council members and everyone here is that we continue to work with Cetul, an organization that supports workers, and to support workers so that this kind of wage theft uh, can continue in the city of Minneapolis. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kevin, followed by Roger and Abel on deck. Is Kevin Morse here? Yes. Yes. Come on up. Then we are followed by Roger Bratch and uh, Abel Garcia. Well, uh, my name is Kevin Morse, and I'm an activist uh, for the labor movement. I've been a union member for over 50 years now retired, uh, but still active. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that you called my name, but I'm grateful. Um, I think it's important to have a, a law in effect uh, that does guarantee a minimum wage for the city workers. Uh, a lot of times there are uh, the environment, the social environment of the workplace prevents people from getting paid as they should, uh, all the money due to them. And uh, I lived through that experience myself, not so much in my last few years because you get involved in the, one gets involved in the legal process and it does give a person to uh, fight and win against those that will uh, take money coming to workers, um, uh, give uh, overtime uh, awarded by favoritism, and thus I think it's so important that the council supports um, the bill that's up for vote and uh, that people are guaranteed a $15 an hour minimum wage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Next up we have Roger Bratch. I apologize if I'm saying your name's wrong. You got it right, thank you. All right, uh, <laughs> followed by Abel Garcia and then Maya Bradford. Okay, uh, thank you for giving me some time to speak. I'm a senior custodian with uh, Minneapolis Public Schools and I just learned now that we may not be covered by this. And I was hoping that we could look at maybe expanding to the schools because wage theft does run rampant in the schools. We uh, take pride in our work and we do stay after just to make sure things get done. And we're now due to the declining population of the schools. Our buildings don't get smaller, but our staff gets smaller. And uh, therefore, our job expands annually on what we need to do. And we always want to make sure we get it done. We want a safe, clean building for our kids and uh, teachers as well. And I know that there's other workers, the food service workers feel the same way. I've seen food service working way after they're supposed to go but not getting paid for it, you know, it, it just goes on and on, right down to the uh, SCAs and EAs and all support staff. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Next up, we have Abel Garcia, followed by Maya Bradford and Maria Machuta on deck. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Carla and I'm representing Furia Tribal. We are a union contractor and I'm glad to be here and speak and name, you know, their contractors. So but I'm glad we having this, you know, kind of events and conversations where we can spawn our uh, difficult situation that we are uh, confronting. For the, for, the, for the industry market in construction, we are, being a union, we are glad to have competitive wage for our employees, but also we are losing because these other contractors in the markets, they are not offering uh, good, good pay for the employees and they are, take, they are taking the jobs. A union company is paying workers' comp, is paying benefits, is paying um, 
good benefits for their employees, but we are not having support uh, because these other contracts in the market, they are paying in cash, they are not paying taxes. So we ask him to take actions about that. So small companies like Frida Tribal, minority companies, they can keep growing. Hi, good morning. I'm good afternoon. My name is Eduardo Garcia. So I'm from Rochester. So the company, my company number is Remodeling DL. So tomorrow I will sign with the union because I've said same with my friend Frida. She said, I mean, the market is really hard for, for us, for minority. And then so I come for support the tax fraud because uh, the, some people, they don't pay us in the, in the time. And then so we cannot pay the guys too. Yeah, that's, that's the point. And then so they affect me, they affect my company, they affect my, um, my community too. Because we don't have, I mean, we need to pay the taxes. So now, so tomorrow we gotta sign with the union because I want to, to pay the, the right thing to my guys because and so those guys, they get the best life for their own families. Yeah, so that's, that's why. So tomorrow we will sign with the union because I want, I want no criminal no more. I don't want like the people they see me like, hey, what's going on with you, man? Yeah, so, okay, so, so thank you so much. Great, thank you. Congratulations on the union. Next up, we have Maya Bradford, followed by Maria Machuta, and then Humberto Messili. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, my name is Maya. I'm a Restaurant Opportunity Center member, um, and I worked in Minneapolis restaurants for about three years. Um, I think this wage theft law is really important. One of my experiences with wage theft was when I was working at night shift as a cashier, and my manager didn't have the key to lock my till. Um, at the end of my shift, when my manager counted the till, he claimed that $50 was missing. And he said, that means I will lose my job and the money will come out of my paycheck. Um, I always would be extra careful when working with the till and I never had any issues before with any other managers. So that just didn't sound right to me. Um, he said I could have sex with his friend who was an employee and he would give me the money to make up for my till being short. I was sad that I had to prepare to lose my job because my baby was only six weeks old and I was preparing to start school in the fall. Um, um, so I was really grinding. Um, the next day, I came to work and talked to my other manager, and she said that I wouldn't lose my job for that, but the money will be taken out of my paycheck. I was disappointed because the manager didn't lock my till, and there were so many other employees working. So, um, And I knew I didn't steal any money. Um, employers are overusing their power with wage theft. This type of stuff happens to a lot of my friends who were only 16 and experienced this too. Um, this law will really reduce the opportunity for employers to take advantage of their employees. And I hope this law expands to every city. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Next up, we have Maria, followed by Humberto, and then Kevin Kendrick. Hi, I'm... Hi, I'm Maria Machuda, and I've been in the restaurant industry for three years, and I'm with the Rock um, Center. Um, I support the work with the um, ordinance for waste stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. Next up, we have Umberto, followed by Kevin, and then John San Sandhall. Buenas tardes. Eh, no hablo mucho inglés, eso es que con permiso de ustedes le voy a pedir a mi compañero que me haga el favor de interpretar. Hello, good afternoon. I don't speak much English, so I'm going to ask my um, my friend here, me, <laughs> to, to interpret for, for me. Okay. Muy bien. Mi nombre es Humberto Miseli y soy miembro de CETUL. Hello, my name is Humberto Miseli and I am a member of CETUL. Señores concejales, mi presencia ante ustedes como trabajador de la construcción Obedece para pedirle si apruebe Minneapolis para su vigencia y efecto la nueva ley 
que protege al trabajador contra el robo de salario. So, city council members, I'm asking today that you um, um, approve the new Minneapolis uh, wage theft ordinance uh, and that, uh, and that uh, will protect the workers in, in, against wage theft. Ley que ya tiene su vigencia en todo el estado de Minnesota, menos en Minneapolis. It's, it's a lay that's already in effect in, in the state of Minnesota, uh, with the exception of Minneapolis. La industria de la construcción es una de las más fuertes y grandes, no solo en Minnesota, sino en toda la Unión Americana. The construction industry is one of the biggest and strongest, not only in um, Minnesota, but in the entire um, uh, United States. Y Minneapolis es una ciudad de constante crecimiento y desarrollo. Un Eden, un paraíso para las compañías constructoras. And this uh, city of Minneapolis is, is in constant growth and development. It's basically an eating of paradise for companies and construction, construction companies to develop. Lo vemos a diario, el sinnúmero de obras en construcción. Y los que trabajamos en esta industria, no solo nos exponemos a excesos de responsabilidades, bajos sueldos, discriminación, And we, okay. inseguridad. Mm -hmm. And then we see it there, um, at, we see it daily that you know we we as construction workers we have um, countless countless t types of jobs that we do in the construction industry and we can have countless responsibilities on top of that and we 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 uh, have and 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 to pay us for that we have very low salaries and also we have uh, we are re re really vulnerable um, to wage theft. También somos muy vulnerables al robo del salario y tráfico laboral. Wage theft and, and um, labor trafficking. Así lo ha demostrado lo que era más presencia de compañeros trabajadores. Um, this is what we have seen in, in, uh, as, as you can tell from other like, testimonies that have come up. Que han llegado a nuestra organización CETUL. And that have also come to CETUL and um, with, their, with their complaints. Solicitando se les ayude asking for their help, for CETUL's help to recover those stolen wages. A tratar de recuperar el salario que se les niega pagar. And to try to recover those stolen wages that they're being denied. Algunos les han dado cheques sin fondos. Some of them have received um, um, checks, without fun, checks without funds. O sencillamente su empleador desapareció, o como decimos, ya no dio la cara. Or so sometimes simply the employer disappears, or they just don't show face anymore. En mi caso, después de haber trabajado durante algún tiempo en una compañía. Um, in my case, after having worked for a company for a period of time. Eh, me retuvieron los salarios injustificadamente. Um, they um, kept my wages unjustly. Así llegué a Cetul, así conocí a Cetul, pidiendo también ayuda. And that's how I got to know Cetul, and I started, and I asked for help. Que el caso que se llevó hasta los tribunales. And we went um, to court for, in our case. Y de un 100%, o sea, de 13 mil dólares. Of 13,000 dólares. La corte autorizó que me pagara solo un 10%, o sea, 1,300 dólares. The court authorized that I only get paid 1,300 dólares, so just 10%. Yo pienso I think. que si en ese tiempo hubiera existido una ley lo, como la que hoy estamos pidiendo, ustedes hagan el favor de aprobar. El resultado pues hubiera sido otro. Ni siquiera hubiera yo llegado a los tribunales. I don't think. I think that the result would have been very different. I don't think I wouldn't have had to come to court. All right. Uh, the, the time is up. So um, if you could go ahead and wrap up yeah, your last thought. Ok. Por lo cual pedimos una vez más a ustedes, aprueben para sus efectos y vigencia en esta ciudad de Minneapolis esta ley para que ponga fin a esta práctica. So we ask you today to please support this ordinance today so that we can end wage theft and support workers. Gracias por su atención. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Next up we have Kevin Kendrick followed by uh, John Sadal and, um, and then we're on number 10. Iris Altamariano. All right, Kevin, you're up. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Kendrick. I'm from St. Paul, but I live and work in Minneapolis uh, near uh, Dingy Town, Como area. 
Um, and I mean, all I'm gonna say is uh, we got our 15 wa uh, wage ordinance passed a couple years ago, but we needed it 10 years ago. And so moving forward with this wage theft ordinance and everything, I just ask you to be hyper, -vig hyper vigilant um, and to just ensure that um, more workers get covered it as we heard today, like some people won't be. So let's look at expanding that and please be hyper vigilant because we've waited way too long for this wage. Let's make sure that everyone's getting it moving forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. John followed by Iris and then Lloyd Brown on deck. Do we have, oh there we go. Hi, I'm John Sandal. I'm a restaurant worker in Minneapolis. Um, so as difficult as it is for me to stand in front of a government that's favored business over people for far too long, I understand the importance of it. In order to make a change, we need to speak the same language that the business owners and the bosses speak. Um, so we function in a system of risk, reward, and profit. So it should come to, as no surprise that, especially in the restaurant industry, wage theft has become so normalized because the risk outweighs or there, there's little risk and a high reward. Businesses see people as profits, not as the hardworking human beings that they are. This ordinance will provide tools for workers to hold perverted business owners and bosses accountable and increase the risk so that they won't do it anymore. Um, so anybody who stands against this ordinance is in a sense spitting in the face of the people who are holding their hands out in front of them. That's the people who have built this city, the people who cook the food, the people who serve them food, and the people who clean, and anybody else that makes this city the great city it is. Um, so we are the workers and we stand together united and strong. Thanks. Thank you so much. Next up we have Iris. And, yeah, sorry, I didn't get that even remotely close. <laughs> Followed by Lloyd Brown and then uh, Taylor Sheffy. Hello, um, committee members. My name is Iris Iris Altamirano, and I'm the president of SCIU Local 26. We are a union of 8,000 property service workers, uh, majority... Uh, POC, but we absolutely reflect the diversity of our great state. Um, and I wanted to thank the committee members, particularly um, Palmasano, Fletcher, and Cunningham for um, bringing this ordinance forward and having this hearing today. Um, I'd like to share with you two member stories. Um, one is of a worker named Cirilio. Uh, Cirilio works in the retail janitorial industry, um, so cleans your local target, most likely. And um, in our industry, being that we are unions, the way that wage stuff usually plays out is um, contractually agreed upon raises. And so even though we know, like for example, in retail, um, our workers' raises happen in March. So then in March, we are super diligent, right, to ensure that, that the raises happen. They, it didn't for Cedillo. Um, and so we had the proper mechanisms to be able to get $240 back just for Cedillo. Um, for Don, Don Cook, who is a, a U.S.-born worker, and I share that mostly because we know by design uh, which workers are the most vulnerable and the ones that are most taken advantage of. Um, and that is young workers like we heard, older workers like we heard, and mostly immigrant workers. But wage theft is not exclusive to just vulnerable workers. Um, in Don's case, he's a U.S. born worker, white worker, who did get a raise but got 10, 10 cents off. So then we had to go back and use all of our mechanisms to in, enforce, right, and make sure that anything that was agreed upon um, actually gets done. And these are all already contractually agreed upon raises and conditions and all of the above. And we still have to do our due diligence, enforce, and implement. Um, and so I just want to express the importance of this ordinance, um, the comprehensive moves that this body is doing to complement the 15 that has already been um, done and the wage theft from the state. And so um, this is just, in our opinion, a way for irresponsible and even some responsible contractors, right, to do what they're supposed to do. Um, 
We also want to emphasize how, you know, how our great Paul Wellstone said, we all do better when we all do better. And this move that the body is doing and this committee is doing with the work of the workforce committee is um, so, so important to be competitive. I mean, we are a union city and we need to stay that way and bottom feeders aren't helping us um, be responsible. Thank you. Thank you, Elise. I've seen your name in print, had it had to say it out loud yet. So nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Next up, we have Lloyd Brown, followed by Taylor, and then number 13, Eli Edelson Stein. Hello. Uh, my name is Lloyd Brown, and I'm a member of St. Tool, and I also sit on the board. And um, I experienced like wage stuff in my teenage years, and then, and it's been uh, dope. But in my teenage years, I really didn't know what to do about it because, like, I didn't have an organization like St. Tool that I didn't have an organization like St. Tool that was around at the time that um, gave me information, educated me on my rights as being an employee versus being an uh, employer, you know. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what the uh, other lady was saying about the um, contra uh, the contractors uh, paying cash and the legit businesses. And I'm in like a bad between that right now. And because like the, the legit businesses, they pay good wages, but if the um, businesses that's willing to pay cash paying more and they don't pay taxes, that help, uh, it makes the legit businesses suffer, you know, and I think that I was just uh, joking outside with uh, one of my uh, members of my group, and I said, this law is the best thing that happened to Minnesota since Prince, <laughs> you know, and even though it's just a joke, but it's kind of true, you know, and um, I just think that it's past due, and it to be it, a piece of paper is a piece of paper until it's enforced and reinforced over and over again. You know, you just can't take one case or pick any case. You know, you got to look at all cases individually. That's that's what I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Next up, we have Taylor, followed by Eli, and with uh, Juana Sinto on deck. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Cunningham and council members um, for being here today and for presenting this. Um, my name is Taylor Chevy and I am a constituent of Ward 9 and I am an organizer at the Center of Workers United in Struggle. Um, this is so important. I can't even speak enough about it. I will only fraction on a piece of it, but I know when I was 20, speaking personally, I experienced wage theft as a barista, and I didn't know that I had rights, and someone actually filed a complaint on my behalf, and I won that money back. So it is very important that folks um, know that they can come forward, and I wanna speak particularly about the retaliation part. Um, it is absolutely, absolutely essential that there are protections against retaliation. Um, it is all too common that folks experience wage theft. Um, there's actually a study by NELP, the National Employment Law, Law Project, that said 43% um, of workers experience retaliation when they came forward. And if we are actually going to change that, we have to take intentional action to make sure that workers do not face retaliation when they come forward. Um, and actually part of that same national study said that 20% of folks that do experience wage theft don't even come forward for fear of retaliation or because they don't think there's any hope and nothing will be changed because of it. So, I mean, this is way, 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 way too common. For example, um, also for the city to be able to enforce wage theft when they are already doing other enforcement. Um, for instance, at McDonald's a couple years ago when they were not paying the minimum wage, there was other wage theft issues that the city was not even able to connect on, which meant that workers would have had to go through another agency and another process, and we can just nip that in the bud right here. Um, and particularly the rebuttable presumption, um, like I think the assistant attorney mentioned, that is not something that's in the state law and it is actually something very progressive and necessary um, because it puts, we're talking about level playing fields between bosses that steal wages and bosses that don't. We know it is not a level playing field between bosses and employees and so it would shift the burden of proof to the employer within 90 days of taking an adverse action against a worker who had filed a complaint. 
um, that had come forward to say that they're not retaliating. And that is absolutely something that should be kept in and passed with this wage theft ordinance. So thank you very much. Um, in the 12 years that Setul has existed, we've recovered over $2 million in stolen wages. That's not even everything that people came forward to file claims with, and that's only a portion of what actually happens. Um, like we heard, this is not just um, just even for workers' rights, this is a racial justice issue. More black and Latinx workers and indigenous workers are this, experiencing this more than white folks. And women are two-thirds of low-wage workers, so it is absolutely an issue of gender justice as well, not to mention our LGBTQ folks out there and immigrants um, that are also experiencing this. So thank you. Please pass this. Thank you so much. We're on number 13, Eli, followed by uh, Juana and Erica, um, sorry, I can't really see it, but I'm going to say Cas Castro, um, and to the city, uh, to the uh, clerk, do we have any other signups? Okay, great. Floor is yours. Hi, council members. Thank you. Um, my name is Eli Edelson-Stein. I uh, live in Ward 10. Uh, I've been a restaurant worker in the Twin Cities for the last 12 years, and I'm an organizer with the Restaurant Opportunity Center of Minnesota. Um, in 12 years of working in the industry, uh, I've seen that uh, slide that Brian had put up, the list of every type of wage theft happening. Um, and in talking to our workers in the field, many of whom who couldn't be here today, um, this is a, a, a form of business that's been systematized in our industry. Um, and I think that uh, Maya's story <clears throat> really strikes me because wage theft isn't just about wages, it's about power. Um, and folks often know or get the feeling that wages are being stolen uh, and they don't, they don't stand up because they're afraid, right? Because we're, cause we know how much power a boss holds over us because if it's missing 10 cents an hour, or no job at all, we know that's an easy equation, right? So I think being really mindful about these retaliation pieces, the things that you're adding to the enforcement that's already getting stronger is important, but also knowing that this is only one step and that enforcement is a huge issue about this, right? And going out and being proactive about that. So I would encourage you all as you go forward, every uh, budgetary um, question you come up against in the years to follow that you're prioritizing workers in those um, in those budget conversations and it's not just about ordinances it's about putting uh, your money where the ordinance is um, so thank you for the courage to do this and to prioritize workers and please pass this thank you Eli next up we have um, Juana followed by Erica um, and then number 16 Carlos um, on deck. Welcome, Juana. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Juana Cinto. Eh, soy miembro de CETUL. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Juana Cinto. I am a member of CETUL. Eh, yo estoy aquí también para exponer mi problema que tuve cuando trabajé con un, este, uh, con un señor en un daycare. Um, I'm here to also uh, expose my problem when I used to work with uh, a daycare center. Uh, el señor este, no me pagó, eh, me, me dio cheques sin fondos. Um, the, uh, the, the owner of the daycare didn't pay me. He gave me uh, checks without funds. Eh, le hice llamadas, lo busqué para que me pagara y nunca respondió. And I tried to get, get a hold of him, called him, and tried to contact him in other means. He never responded back. Y es hasta ahorita que sigo peleando todavía para que me pague lo que él me debe, que and, es un mes que no me pagó. And I'm still fighting to recover my wages it's because it's a, it's a month's worth of work. Um, entonces, por eso estamos, estoy aquí para pedirles que por favor este ayuden a pasar esta ley para que muchas personas como nosotros no sigamos pasando esto. Mm -hmm. And so like, that's why I'm here to also ask for support to make sure that this law gets passed uh, because I don't want other people to go through what I went to um, with wage theft. Puesto que esto es muy desesperante, muy estresante por no recibir el pago que, que nos merecemos por el trabajo que hacemos. Mm -hmm. Because it's very, we go into a very desperate mode. Um, it's also, uh, we lose hope because we, we don't think we're ever going to see our wages that we've already worked for. Por ejemplo, yo tengo un hijo, es pequeño, y en ese tiempo yo necesité mucho uh, para pagar mi renta. 
y también para comprar comida para el niño. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a kid. Um, he's a young kid, and like you know, he depends on me. And when this when this wage step happened, I had to come up with money to pay rent and to also get some food. Um, entonces por eso este les pido por favor que nos ayuden con eso con pasar esa ley para que a uh, los empleadores no abusen de nosotros. Mm -hmm. And and that's why I'm here to again ask for the support so that uh, we can get this passed and so that uh, employers stop abusing workers. Y, um, muchas gracias por escuchar. And thank you for uh, listening. Okay. Thank you so much, Juana. Next up, we have Erica, followed by Carlos with Bill on deck. We're on number, uh, Erica's number 15. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Erika Castro. Good afternoon. My name is Erika Castro. Uh, fui víctima de robo de salario. I was a, a, a wage theft victim as well. Uh, el motivo que, que fue... Uh, Yo en ese tiempo uh, tenían que pagarme, que era un día, eh, y no me, no me llegó ni mi cheque, ni mi dinero. Uh, y yo hablé con el encargado y pues dijo que ya no había trabajo y dijo que ya estaba mi cheque y que ya lo habían cobrado. Mm. And um, when I was working, um, I was asking for my paycheck and the guy didn't want, didn't want to give me my paycheck. He said that it was already mailed out. And or um, give me one second. And um, and when I asked, and when he said that it was already mailed out, he also said afterwards. I asked him again. He said that it was already cashed. Uh, yo seguí preguntando que por qué y como yo estuve preguntando que dónde se fue mi dinero de lo que yo trabajé, eh, me dijeron que ya no ya no tenía yo que trabajar y pues nada más por eso me despidieron de que yo pregunté dónde estaba mi dinero. Yeah, and so what this and what this led up to was that I was asking continuously for my paycheck, and instead of them being like, "Here, give you my pay, here's your pay," they fired me because I kept on asking and asking, and they just said, "We don't have no more work for you." Y pues eso es es la, la lo que pasamos nosotros como trabajadores y queremos saber si tenemos una o sea te, tenemos que tener eh, confianza para los demás trabajos también. Mm -hmm. And so like this keeps on happening and like we need to have laws that are going to have uh, affect workers because like we need to have hope when we start a new work, a new job. Pues eso es todo y esperemos que nos ayuden para pasar la la ley para los derechos de nosotros los trabajadores. Mm -hmm. And that's that's it and I hope that you all support this law to get it passed and support workers against wage theft. Gracias. Thank you so much, Erica. Next up, we have Carlos, followed by Bill, and then uh, Israel Arando on deck. Oh, welcome, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just waiting. Um, yeah, I want to. The reason I'm testifying too is because, like, I've been I'm an organizer for like against wage theft. And I've worked with a lot of people who are going through this problem, and like it's not fair for them to pay these consequences when they get their wages stolen because it's not their fault. Who it really ends up losing is them and their family, and they get really undervalued. Um, I mean, just think about it. Like, I'm pretty sure you're all getting good salaries. If you didn't get paid, like, how is that really going to affect your your livelihood, right? And the process that we have now to recover wage theft, recover wages, is like very long and it's not really supporting those who are really vulnerable to wage theft. Um, we oftentimes have to go to conciliation court and that itself is also a big process. Um, recently, uh, two weeks ago, we came here with uh, three wage theft cases and we had to fight them off at uh, conciliation court, but the, um, what's called the owner or the person that owes the wages didn't appear. So he, he can easily still wash his hands off from wage theft and still leave a worker or an employee with anguish of like their system in place but I still have to wait in the hopes of recovering my wages. And like, you know, like the recovery, like the collections parts of like the judgment is so hard for even people who don't really know how to do it and oftentimes seems scary because it seems like it's a like very legal thing and it's just not fair. And I just hope that we can really pass this law where it's gonna really 
flip the script of like employers who are committing wage theft to pay those consequences. Because I think we are all tired for us low wage workers to like be getting treated like this and like be put in harsh conditions and every day we have to even face harsh conditions to like our, our lives and then like if we get like in a car accident or anything, where are we gonna get the money from, you know? Kind of situations like that. Um, and and yeah, like, you know, employers just have the guts to like do whatever they want. And it's really, I'm also like just wanting to flip the script of like employers thinking that they're above the law or that they're above um, uh, ordinance or city laws that are not gonna affect them just because they're a small employer or big employer or if their name is recognized in the community, just for that reason they will commit wage theft. And because they feel protected from like, the community that should be protecting the workers, not the employers. Um, and I'm not saying like go against every employer, I'm just saying go against the employers who are committing wage theft and flip the script and make them pay consequences. So, that's it. Thank you, Carlos. Next up we have Bill, followed by Israel Arando, and number 19, Sean Broom. Do we have Bill? Lofke? Nope. Okay. Next up, we have Israel Arando, followed by Sean Broom, and number 20, Juan Herrera. Do we have Israel? All right. <laughs> Then next up, we have Sean Broom, followed by Juan Herrera, and number 21, Raymond. Good afternoon, and thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you today. I want to start by emphasizing that the position of the Minneapolis Regional Chamber is that wage theft is an abomination. It is wrong to steal what has been earned by others. We wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that we supported the state's recently passed wage theft law. It's the strongest in the country. And I want to thank the authors of this ordinance and the members of this committee for their outreach and their willingness to listen to the concerns of the business community. It's appreciated. But the Chamber and our members do want to take a second to share three items that we think could make this ordinance work better for businesses and employees in Minneapolis. The first is we hope that it can be made explicit that wherever signatures are required, electronic signatures are acceptable. Secondly, we ask that penalties applied under this ordinance are not cumulative with state penalties, and we would urge you to consider creating a penalty structure that reflects the burdens on small business owners. Finally, we ask the City of Minneapolis to make its regulatory requirements match the state's to the fullest extent possible. We understand that there are extra requirements that will have to be accommodated, sick and safe time on pay stubs, for example. But the state law has yet to be implemented fully because of the limited time for education and outreach by the Department of Labor. The regulatory increment created by the City of Minneapolis is one that it must educate it about, and one that it must enforce. Given the limitations to both the city and the state's ability to educate and engage with business owners, could a stronger partnership with the state be used to educate and enforce the existing wage theft law? And would that be the best use of taxpayer resources? We simply ask that wherever record keeping, compliance, and employee notice are required, that they match state law as closely as possible. And I want to end on an offer of assistance. From our over 1,400 members to the partnerships that we have with local and cultural chambers of commerce, to the relationships with regional business associations and statewide business groups, we have the ability to help you talk to employers, to get meaningful feedback, and tell the story of the good things the City of Minneapolis is doing. We want to help you do that work. Finally, thank you again for giving me an opportunity to speak, and a special thank you to the authors for advancing this important work. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Sean. Next up is uh, Juan Herrera, followed by Raymond with Oscar Reyes on deck. Is Juan Herrera here? All right. Is Raymond here? All right. Followed by Oscar Reyes and Jason on deck. Hello, I'm Raymond Zirin, Electrical Workers Local 292. And before I was a union member, I was a victim of wage theft as well. I'm here to speak in favor of the wage, wage theft ordinance. Um, it wasn't, uh, this was, when I was a victim, it was back in 1996, 
And uh, it was rectified through a process that I had, I had no knowledge of, uh, but uh, it was through an audit that this wage theft was caught, and I got paid my back wages. Uh, and it, every time we go to work, we're creating prosperity. Workers create prosperity. Workers should get that prosperity in return. It should come back to them, and it should have a positive effect on everybody's community. So uh, once again, um, I, I speak in favor of this ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Next up is Oscar Reyes, and then uh, last on the list we have Jason. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hassel Reyes. Um, thank you to um, all the counselors. Um, first of all, uh, I want to thank everybody for supporting and um, trying to pass um, this law. Um, I used to be an employee, and um, I didn't get this right. Uh, and I'm so happy to, um, to get in support. And it's kind of weird because I'm an owner of a restaurant. And this is a very um, good thing for us to be disciplined and to uh, fill out more documents and to get more knowledge about uh, doing the things right for not be wasting time on just receiving a letter from these uh, organizations. And some people, well, in my case, I've been learning so much. I've been in, uh, living in the uh, United States for almost 23 years and been on, uh, on a restaurant for that long uh, with my family. I'm the third generation. Uh, when I received this, um, this issue by one organization that I eat, um, it's around here, uh, right after I uh, read the letter, uh, it took me um, a few minutes to make a phone uh, call back. Uh, I made a, um, an appointment with them. I brought all documents that they needed to see, uh, people that didn't bring anything. And I was a little upset at that point because um, I think that these organizations need to be, um, to be in action. But um, I suggest to listen more carefully to employees because sometimes they don't tell the truth. They just feel that they have a lot of support and they start making things up. But this is a good, um, a good experience that I had because I brought these, all those documents from this uh, person and they didn't have anything, any to show. Um, okay, I was a little upset and I said, okay, really we can reschedule it. So the second time, they didn't show up and I feel good. I feel good about it. And that's why I'm trying to, uh, uh, well not trying, but uh, I support this, um, this law to be passed because um, it's good for us to know that everybody's doing the things right. I'm a little um, um, concerned about this law to be, um, I'm a little worried because uh, there are people, a lot of people are gonna be taking advantage of, on the sick days that has to be paid. And we're going to be um, uh, struggling because it's, it takes now that I'm, I'm putting up my, uh, my new restaurant, we have to work as um, employees, we have to work as employees, and special dates, people are going to be taking advantage of just calling, say I'm sick. And we have, it seems for me, I feel like we're going to be like changing uh, um, employees by the time because, I don't know, some... I, I don't think it's um, something right, but um, I hope we can work everything we can work together as um, employers and as employee. But I just, um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, thank you. <clears throat> the time is about up, so if you yes. wrap up your last um, Just to, um, uh, to try t to listen to, I don't know how they can, how they can do this, but some, sometimes uh, uh, people are just uh, putting some more words but um, that's, that's basically, that basically I'm happy to pass this and I'm, I'm supporting as well this, uh, this law. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. Next up, last up, we have Jason. 
Greetings, Honorable Council uh, members. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you impromptu today, and thank you. Um, my name is Jason. I consider myself a, a, a gentleman, and I try and uh, represent what the Lord God Almighty wants, which is to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly before the Lord. And that I've observed um, this issue of wages from a distance. And um, Councilman Gordon, you um, tapped on the, the the item of contract workers, um, especially in the con um, construction industry that we've heard today, especially in the Latino population. They may not have a real strong assertive voice, and they need us to be a voice to the voiceless. And so. Um, the operative word, while in many cases it is clear between employees and um, independent contractors, there is um, a dispute in the marketplace, something called misclassification. And it has to do with independent um, workers that are told they're independent contractors, but they're treated as employees. And it's a, been a 10-year lawsuit in the transportation industry uh, nine and ten figure lawsuits, um, but on a local, more personal level in construction where most all the workers are independent contractors, they're dictated where they have to go and what they have to do and what they're paid, and perhaps they may work for bosses that work for bosses, and so they may not get the actual representation and strength that they, that they need and, in a sense, may usurp a, a certain amount of promised wages as, as we've heard. So I just wanted to call to light that um, a quick item with regard to um, independent contractors and misclassification and that um, I believe from what little I know about the law and regulation that, you know, if you're treated like an employee but on paper you're an independent contractor, you might be entitled to um, the wage protection that a worker would as well. So thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here and uh, be heard for those that may not uh, know that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, folks. Thank you so much. I also just want to thank the organizations that are here to be a megaphone for folks. Um, I, I think sometimes we think of uh, various communities as being helpless, and I think that organizations are really being able to uh, push back on that narrative. Um, are there any, is there anyone else signed up? All right, is there anyone else wishing to speak to this item? Anyone? Anyone? All right, seeing no further folks to speak to this item, I will go ahead and close the public hearing. I will uh, also move approval of the passage of ordinance um, amending Title II of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to administration, preventing wage theft, adding overtime and break requirements, and restricting city contractor contracts from being awarded to entities with outstanding wage obligations. I will see if there are any questions or comments from my colleagues. Uh, welcome, Councilmember Fletcher. We'll let you kick it off. Thank you, Chair Cunningham, and thanks to everyone who testified. I think it really demonstrates the importance of the work that we're doing, the number of stories that we hear, and uh, the number of people who came out to show their support. So I'm uh, thrilled to be part of this work and want to really appreciate uh, all of my colleagues who have spent time digging into this and uh, also showing their support. Um, and particularly want to shout out the Workplace Advisory Committee and the, the work that went in. You know, this was really generated by a collaboration um, with uh, a whole lot of people, including labor advocates and business owners and uh, large business representatives uh, working together with our Civil Rights Department. Uh, to really come up with something uh, pretty extraordinary. And they kind of gave us the roadmap, uh, and we uh, took it up and followed it. But I want to just really recognize that a lot of people were involved in generating uh, this idea and, and uh, driving this forward. And both our Civil Rights Department and our City Attorney's Office did terrific work uh, getting us uh, to where we are. Uh, as people noted, the independent contractor uh, piece of this is going to move separately and a little bit later, but we're continuing to work on that. Uh, and I'm uh, very enthusiastic to see this happen. So, uh, and I uh, wanted to also recognize uh, our uh, allies at the Department of Labor who we had uh, 
uh, terrific meeting with to really talk about how it is going to work for us to collaborate and to not duplicate efforts, but to make sure that what we're doing is uh, really building on the strength of both organizations and making sure that uh, enforcement and protection is is shared broadly and, and uh, uh, that we can use the strengths of, of both the state and the city to protect workers in Minneapolis. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Com Council Member Fletcher. We'll come to Council Vice President Jenkins and we'll bounce over to Palmasano. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. I will be supporting this um, ordinance today. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues, um, yourself and, and Council Members Palmasano and Fletcher, for bringing this work forward. At a time in our um, nation when the very core of our democracy is being um, attacked, I, I think it's really important for us every opportunity we can to stand up and support workers. It has been stated earlier that um, workers create prosperity, um, and, and certainly they do, but prosperity for who? And so we need to ensure that um, people are being fairly compensated for their um, labor um, and, and really uphold the rights of workers. So I'm happy to support this ordinance today. Thank you, Council Vice President. Uh, Council Member Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for inviting us to be with you um, as we listen through the public hearing. I want to appreciate the work that we've done together and with stakeholders around this issue, the Workplace Advisory Committee, and especially a thank you to Brian Walsh and Andrea Naif for their hard work on this. Uh, we continue to hear the stories of workers in so many different industries, and that's hard to come up and to a microphone and share a very personal story um, without, with the fear of retaliation, with your life stories, and I want to say thank you for adding your voice to this work. Um, we spent a lot of time making sure that this is tenable to our thriving business com community as well which you will hear as we introduce some important amendments um, here shortly. So um, I just want to appreciate that. Business was included and will continue to be included in the conversation at different levels. Um, the feedback has been taken very seriously and we've really worked well with Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry folks because so much of what we need to do with this ordinance for the next year will really be about education. Um, a lot of employers think, oh, wage theft, that's not something that I do, and they stop working. They, they put the new compliance work from the state aside, and we really need to show the importance of this as a compliance tool and something that every, every employer in the state needs to pay attention to the state version of it. And it, was, it seems timely to do these small changes in concert with importing the state law so that we can be part of that effort and work together with the state on this initiative. So thank you for letting me add my two cents. And thank you both to you and Council Member Fletcher for your leadership on this work. Council Member Gordon. Thank you very much. I also want to thank my colleagues for bringing this forward. and and carrying this forward and also the Workplace Advisory Committee and everybody who got involved and showed up today. This has been powerful and really important. Also, as um, the old guy up here, I also want to tip my hat to the former council uh, members last term and their uh, staff and others who worked and built this and also the previous mayor. We had a working families agenda and this was listed on there. It's been exciting seeing us tick things off, safe and sick time, minimum wage, um, wage theft, um, all we have left is fair scheduling, um, and then we'll have accomplished what we set out to accomplish, I don't know, almost eight years ago now. So this is great. This is a great, a great day. Of course, I'm concerned about the, sh the, the new economy, the shared economy, the independent contractors, and misclassification class mis of workers. I also did want to call out the fact that this won't relate to the public employees, the um, school district and those things. So we want to hold those organizations in the county and the University of Minnesota uh, accountable um, for getting on board. But still, this is a day worth celebrating and uh, <clears throat> delighted to see this coming forward. Thank you. 
Are there any other questions, comments from my colleagues? Well, I'll go ahead and, and speak now uh, to this. Um, I am so grateful to be a part of this work. As probably many of you have heard me say a few times now, um, this work is really personal for me. Um, I was raised in a, a household where my mother, who is actually here, hey mom, uh, <laughs> uh, she experienced a lot of barriers to employment and experienced a lot of uh, low-wage jobs. So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, working in dry cleaners as well as um, being a hotel cleaner, and she experienced a lot of wage theft throughout my childhood. And uh, we were able to maintain some financial stability within our household because my dad was in um, a union for almost 40 years. So that was how we were able to maintain stability. But had he not been in the union, had it just been, for example, me and my mom, my life would have looked very different as a result. Um, and so this work is very personal because I feel like it's my obligation because of the fact that I was able to be where I am today, that it's now my moral obligation to make sure that other children and families don't go through similar experiences. It's heartbreaking to watch your parents work so hard um, and then see them not be able to get paid fairly for the work that they did, knowing that they work hard, that they're brilliant. Um, it, as, a, as a child, that was very hard to watch. And so, um, so I'm hoping to be able to help other kids and their parents as well. Um, would we have an administration that is so aggressively attacking and targeting the most downtrodden in our country, whether that be Latinx, whether it be black folks, whether that be American Indians, it is our responsibility to protect our neighbors. And again, this is something that I feel so honored to be able to do as a council member on the local level, that we get to step up and say, not here. And as we saw the, the new uh, campaign, not on our watch. And that is on multiple levels. So I'm grateful for everyone who came and had the vulnerability to speak their truth to power, naming why this work is so important. Um, yes, it passed at the state level, but we have to dig deeper because the challenges that we face here in Minneapolis are nuanced and we need to step up and be able to address those nuances to the best of our ability. We wanna to continue to show not only the rest of the state, but the rest of the country, how to do this work well and how to step up for our neighbors. With that, um, I also want to um, introduce two amendments, or excuse me, three amendments that uh, should be before uh, my colleagues. Do we have this on the over here as well for folks? So if folks are interested in checking out the amendments, um, I will uh, briefly uh, just cover them. Um, so amendment number one is uh, to uh, 40 point five, 540 item C adding um, unless the change is an increase in wages and the employee is informed in advance of the change of the specific amount of the wage increase and the specific date on which it will occur, in which the case, case the employee signature is not required, and um, then the employer will keep a delete the copy of the uh, notice changes, including a signature where when required. Amendment number two is uh, to 40.530 uh, to item C, adding when doing so would deprive an employee of wages that have been earned. This section shall not prevent employers from recovering overpayments of wages provided that the employee shall be given written notice before overpayment is recovered. And amendment number three, we are uh, 40.580. Um, we have a couple within that, so in, what is that, D6, um, adding the employer's good faith efforts to comply with this article and whether the violation was intentional or inadvert. Item number seven, the employer's good faith, oh, the same thing. And then um, item G is fines not cumulative, the, the director shall 
not impose the civil fines authorized by this section if a state or federal administrative agency charged with the enforcement of labor standard laws um, have previously imposed fines upon the employer for violation of state or federal labor standards law based on the same acts or omissions that constitutes a violation of this article. So I would like to add those amendments to this motion for approval. Are there any questions or Clarification. Yes, Councilmember Gordon. I'm assuming that all three co-authors uh, look at those amendments and supported them, and I'm also curious if this has been vetted with the Workplace Advisory Committee. So yes, all three co-authors have um, have vetted this. Has this? Do you want to speak a little bit more to this, Councilmember Fletcher? Uh, so functionally, these are you know fairly minor changes that uh, you know essentially. Um, uh, uh, operate in the spirit of having uh, listened to feedback from employers, including our own HR department, uh, <laughs> who talked to us about sort of practically how these things were going to work, and so we made those uh, changes. We've certainly run them by some uh, some of the most active members of the Workplace Advisory Committee. I'm, I'm not certain that they've all gone to the full work, Workplace Advisory Committee, but people who've been involved in crafting this have, uh, have seen this. Well, I'm certainly supportive, and of course we've got um 10 days or so until the council meeting anyway. So if somebody comes up with something about these um, minor, what I see is fairly minor um, amendments, we can also deal with it there. Thanks. All right, thank you so much. Seeing no further comments or questions, um, I move approval of item number two as amended. All those in approval, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The ayes have it and that item carries. Thank you. It's a big deal, so we'll take it. All right. <laughs> Seeing no further business before the committee, we are adjourned.